Lord, I just pray that you help us now, Lord, focus, glean what it is from your word that you want us to hear this morning. And not simply hear, God, but help us to apply these things to our daily lives. We want to be wise. We want to be conformed more and more like your Son, Jesus Christ. We want our minds to be renewed. We want our minds to be transformed and we need your help. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, technological advances are quite amazing. I don't know if you're paying attention at all to the, the, the space shuttle launch a couple of months ago, but apparently the astronauts that left, they're coming back. And just that whole process has been amazing. If you think about just the power in the palm of our hands, we can meet every want, every need, just by the touch of our finger, algorithms and artificial intelligence now do the heavy lifting for us. It does the thinking for us. We don't have to think anymore. You know, the reality is my children for sure and for most of my life is foreign to simply typing the question in Google and getting the answer in seconds. You know, none of this is bad and very advantageous to have. But there's no doubt that all of these advancements has had an effect on our ability to think. You know, the most prominent skill listed on job descriptions still today, critical thinking. However, more than half, 60% to be exact, of Fortune 500 CEOs state that when they hire individuals, this is the exact skill they don't have. Why think when I don't have to? Why discern when the majority of people already think a certain way? I'll just go with the crowd. Why think because someone else can do it for me? As the great theologian and songwriter, Big Boy from Outcast said, the sheep people don't think for themselves anymore. You can say anything, and it's the gospel truth. And they don't have to go research it or anything. And they believe everything the news tells them. People don't go and do their own investigations if it's relationships or politics or anything. I want to encourage us this morning with something I believe is sorely needed, has always been needed, especially during this time. And with so much access to the news so much misleading information and so many talking heads and so many controversial hot takes and messages from the left and messages from the right and messages from the middle. How do we as Christians think through all this? Oh dear church, what we need is biblical discernment. The ability to judge truth from error. Right and wrong. The ability to think Biblically, and have a God-honoring lens by which I filter everything going on around me. To rightfully discern the news and information that I see, hear, and read so that I can act and live in such a way that brings glory to God. You know, my goal and aim is simple this morning. That we as a church grow in our biblical discernment. Four points that guide our discussion this morning. First, what is biblical discernment? Second, why we don't have it? Third, how do we get it? And fourth, how do we grow in it? And so in its simplest definition, discernment is nothing more than the ability to decide between truth and error, right and wrong. You know, discernment is this process of making careful distinctions in our thinking about truth. In other words, the ability to think with discernment is synonymous with an ability to think biblically. We are on guard, of course, against 
false teaching and being led astray by false teachers, no doubt. But you know, there's more to discernment than this. There's more to it than that. It means to be able to distinguish the primary from the secondary. Discernment also means to be able to distinguish what's essential and what's not essential. Discernment is also the ability to distinguish what's permanent and what's transient. And yes, it means distinguishing between the good and the better, and even the better from the best. It's knowing that all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, turn there. We have a number of texts this morning, so it's going to be part lecture, part sermon, otherwise known as a lerman. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 teaches us, verse 21, that it is the responsibility of every Christian to be discerning. Verse 21 says this, But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. You know, the Apostle John issues a similar warning to us when he says, Don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 1 John 4, 1. You know, according to Scripture, discernment is not optional. For the believer, this is required. You know, the key to living a life that pleases God lies in your ability, dear church, to exercise discernment in every area of your life. You know, discernment intersects our lives at every point. And praise the Lord that His Word provides us with the needed discernment about every issue of life. And according to Peter, 2 Peter 1.3 says this, that God has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. You see, it's through the true knowledge of Him that we have been given everything we need to live a Christian life in this fallen world. You know, how else do we have a true knowledge of God but through the pages of His Word, but through the Bible? You know, dear Christian, if you're finding yourselves being tossed here and there by waves and being being carried about by every wind of doctrine, you know, it's more than likely that there is a famine of the Word of God in your life, which means that you're lacking discernment. You know, there's nothing more than our enemy wants. There's nothing more than our enemy wants than for us to be distracted. For us to believe the lies, because once we believe the lie then desire has conceived and it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. You know, the father of lies has always worked this way. Back in Genesis, did God really say? He stated to Eve, Oh dear church, may we have a biblical discerning mind. So first point, why? Second point, why don't we have it? We know what it is. Why don't we have it? The problem is our minds do not naturally think this way. Our natural minds are dark. They have been blinded. Out of the heart, the scripture says, the mouth speaks. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. Just a, just a run through of how our minds are described. 2 Corinthians 3 Paul says the mind is hardened. 1 Timothy 6, Paul calls the mind depraved. Ephesians 4, he says, uh, men are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God. And Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1 gives this summation that thinking has become futile and foolish. Why? Because men by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. He warns against being taken captive by philosophy. 
and says in 1 Corinthians 1, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. So if out of the heart, the mouth speaks and out of the heart come evil thoughts, this is because the heart, dear church, is desperately sick, wicked, deceitful than all else. Who can understand it? So because our minds are darkened and thoughts are evil, because our hearts are wicked, because our wills are in bondage to sin, then should it be any surprise that the gospel is foolishness? 1 Corinthians 1, 18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. You see why we need to know this. You see why being able to properly discern all of the nonsense that is out there right now to distract you, to cause and tempt you to compromise, you need to know why that is. This is how the world thinks. You know, the world claims that it's after truth. Veritas, right, that word. Many universities, many mission statements, many crests have this word veritas plastered on there. It's after truth. The reality, though, is natural man is not after truth. The natural man is after suppressing the truth. So, you know, in our viral age, we see this, don't we? We see this. Those who attempt to speak truth and logic are often silenced. Their video posts are removed. Any logical information provided that goes against the grain of popular mainstream thought is quickly removed. Tagged as false information after being reviewed by independent fact checkers. Not sure who they are. Not sure who that would be. You know, you may have come across this, a recent New York Times article accused churches as being a major source of COVID cases. New York Times accusing churches, major source of COVID cases. The lead on the story goes like this. The virus has infiltrated Sunday services, church meetings, and youth camps. More than 650 cases have been linked to reopening religious facilities. As often what publications do, what media in general do, is they use evocative language. Evocative language. Outbreaks are surging. The virus has infiltrated. Cases have erupted. And so on. To cause a stir. To evoke a response from you. Don't think. Just react. Just go off the cuff. It's more scintillating that way. It sounds so alarming. Right? And I'm certainly not making light at all of all that's going on. This doesn't excuse us or our church from being responsible, being thoughtful, being preferential, and being cautious about safety. Those things remain. But further testing and critical thinking of the discerning mind that even uses the world's standard would amount the 650 cases linked to churches at roughly point. Zero two percent. Not two percent. Point zero two. Meaning, 99.98% are attributable to other causes. As Charlie's put it, if I have three million dollars in the bank and you give me another six hundred fifty dollars, you'd hardly be in the position to claim that you had a major contribution to my wealth. Should we be at all surprised why churches are singled out? Should we be at all surprised that abortion clinics and liquor stores are deemed essential 
and churches aren't. We shouldn't. Because the natural man suppresses the truth. Jesus is truth. Natural man opposes God, hates God. And this is where the world thinks. Such are the consequences of sin. Such are the effects of the fall. Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve wanted to know something that God didn't want them to know. They sought knowledge that was forbidden. Or what John Calvin describes as the noetic effects of the fall. Not noetic as in Noah, but noetic effects, meaning intellectual consequences of sin. You know, Romans 1 reminds us that the unregenerate mind cannot reason its way to salvation. The unregenerate mind will never reason its way to the cross. There's no way that we can find salvation in our own intellect because it's overwhelmingly fallen. No matter of communication or seminars or classes or degrees or studies will lead one to salvation because the unregenerate mind and reason is opposed to God. You know, Moeller listed out a number of noetic effects. And this is exactly what's playing out right in front of us. This is exactly what's playing out. Let me read this list, and I cut it short because there's a lot. So here's the list. Should there have been no fall there would be no list of this. So here are the effects on our mind. Ignorance, distractedness, forgetfulness, prejudice, faulty perspective, intellectual fatigue, inconsistencies, failure to draw the right conclusion, intellectual apathy, closed-mindedness, Intellectual pride, miscommunication, I don't think we need more. We need help. We need help. Because in and of ourselves, we cannot gird up enough knowledge to be able to think rightly. The world's way of getting wisdom is different from God's way. The learned of the world gain wisdom and knowledge by applying reason to solve problems, to build buildings, and to create philosophies. But God doesn't make the knowledge of Himself available by those means. You know, it's not wrong to possess knowledge, to have an education, and it's not wrong to use reason and logic to solve problems, but spiritual discernment can't be attained that way. You see why looking to the world, the finite world, to help solve an infinite problem and answer an infinite question will always have the same conclusion. Using the world's standards to influence any of our decisions and influence how we think is dangerous. You know, shame on us if we solely use the movie rating system to inform us whether or not we should be watching something or not. Oh, it's rated R, but I'm 18. Therefore, it's okay to watch. Oh, dear church, we must think and do so biblically in matters of relationships, in matters of politics, what I read, what I listen to, what standard am I using? Oh, we need discernment. So that begs the next question. Next point, how do we get it? We know what it is. We know why we don't have it. So then how do I get it? You know, Christians are commanded to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Therefore, we must think about thinking. Turn to Romans chapter 12. I appreciated prayers this week from many of you as I prepared and think about a sermon on thinking. (laughs) I was fighting intellectual fatigue. But praise the Lord, He has much to say about this topic to us. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says this, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed 
by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So dear church, we need to be renewed. We need to be transformed in such a transformation and renewal and nonconformity needs this miraculous exchange by which your heart of stone now becomes a heart of flesh. Such a transformation of which you were once dead in your trespasses and sins and now have been made alive. Such a transformation that you couldn't attain this knowledge all on your own. You needed it to be told to you. So blinded, such a renewal of our mind needed that we couldn't see this on our own. It needed to be shown to us. You know, Jesus, in speaking to his disciples about the Pharisees, said this, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. You know, Satan has blinded the eyes of unbelievers, so God must shed light on the human mind so that we can understand truth. Dear church, it's impossible to attain wisdom without God. He gives discernment and he also takes it away. Job chapter 12. And wisdom and discernment, as you read Proverbs chapter 1, is personified in someone that we can get to know. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. As I mentioned, we're going to move around a little bit this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Starting in verse 26, we'll read to verse 30, says this. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God. And don't miss this. But by His doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And so therefore, wisdom, otherwise, known as spiritual discernment, is something that comes from knowing Christ. Not knowing for knowledge's sake. This is why we have great scholars who can read the Bible, but the gospel is still foolishness to them. Why? Because they don't know Jesus. A knowledge that bursts forth in intimacy. Not intellectual knowing, but a knowledge of who He is, And what he's done, a knowledge that realizes that Jesus is God and he sees me for what I am, a sinner. Hebrews 4, 12, just listen. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. A knowledge, dear church, that realizes that I'm in the presence of a holy God who sees my heart, who knows my thoughts. You see why the reactions of those who have come to this knowledge of Jesus are consistently the same. There is awe. There's this reverence. There's this holy fear that comes upon a person. A now present discerning mind that realizes without Christ, none of this is possible. A Holy Spirit illumination that causes my blind eyes to see this glory of Christ. You you can't come face to face with Jesus and walk away unchanged. Impossible. Walk away the same. Because He's so beautiful. He's so 
glorious and a truly transformed heart and mind will be different. I'm not talking about struggling. No, I'm not talking about sin. Because those things will still happen. What I'm talking about is there's this fundamental change in how you think. And how you think is linked to how you live. And dear friend, you can call yourself a Christian all you want. But if your mindset hasn't changed and your life hasn't changed and there's no struggle with sin because there's not even a fight being put up, then you may not know Jesus. Quoting John Piper, he says this, The light of God's glory at the cross is so strong that it makes all self-exalting thinking look foolish. You know, you begin to realize, dear church, that your worldview is shifting. Your eyes have been given this biblical filter for which to process information. And trusting in what we think only leads us to fall flat on our faces. It humbles us because God by His grace is so kind as to show us our folly. True wisdom is in Christ. You want truth? John 8, 31, 32 tells us, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed Him, If you abide in My word, you are truly My disciples, and you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Seek Christ. You want to be biblically discerning in your current circumstances? Then, dear church, seek Christ. You want wisdom? Then seek Christ. Seek first His kingdom. So do you know Christ? In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Do you know this Christ that will so captivate your mind, that will so that will so engage your mind. You will be so enamored with Christ and His beauty and so focused on the things of above that nothing on the right or the left can distract you. You are fixated on Him. You can't take your eyes off Him. In Him is fullness of joy. There's this famous phrase, garbage in, garbage out. Folks who are in technology, I'm sure you're familiar with that phrase. It initially referred to the entering of bad data that will only produce bad reporting. It's a very practical phrase, though. What are you ingesting? What are you consuming? For those with Apple products, it's pretty easy. If you got your screen time report, this morning Psalm 101 verse 3 says I will not set my I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless I hate the work of those who fall away it shall not cling to me we need discernment we need help and our last point how do we grow in our discernment We all want to be discerning people. We all want to walk wisely in a world of deception that makes fools of even the most brilliant. But how do we become skilled in discernment? How do we become skilled? The writer of Hebrews tells us this. Turn to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14 tells us this is how we grow in it, dear church. Verse 14, But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So for you sports fans out there, that's right, we're talking about practice. Our discernment is trained through practice. The word practice there is, and training is where we get the word gymnasium. It means to exercise vigorously. You know what that means? 
Here's what it, here's what it practically means. It means that God puts us in difficult situations every day and forces us to confront all of these complexities and to press us to the limits and beyond of our wisdom and understanding. You ever gotten thrown curveballs your way? We get thrown curveballs and at times we feel like we're in a maze. We feel confused sometimes at the end of ourselves because the issues involved are so weighty. They're so important. Experiences not unlike what is going on right now. So in order for us to grow in discernment, we must first recognize that God is the only one who can both give us wisdom and increase it. This requires a characteristic that the world doesn't look very highly upon. Humility. James 1 tells us, those who lack wisdom are to ask God. We don't like asking, do we? Philippians 1.9, Paul says, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. Dear church, we will never outgrow the graces by which God has given to us in this life. To be fruitful, to be uncompromising in truth. Pastor Nick just finished a series on spiritual disciplines, and that's exactly what we need to put into practice to be the discerning people that glorify God and exalt Christ. You know, none of these practical ways of applying should be earth-shattering to you, nor was this my attempt at being creative, because it wasn't. Firstly, Bible reading. Your engagement in the reading of your Bible is a direct reflection, dear church, on what you think about Jesus. If something is important to you, then you'll make time for it, won't you? Dear saints, are we in God's Word? Does the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus count all else as rubbish? Do we cherish God's Word and reading it? You see how we can't be lazy. We can't be lazy in this. This is why it requires discipline, and discipline is hard. And we need to continually be asking God, help me. God, help me. Help me to know what it is you want me to know. You know, God works through your efforts. Second Timothy 2, verse 7, Paul says this, Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. You see the connection? Notice that little word, for. What it means there is this promise of God to give us understanding is the ground of our thinking. It's not the substitute for it. Psalm 119, 66, Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. You know, God's wellspring continually overflows and the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments, how inscrutable His ways, the knowledge of God is inexhaustible. It's eternal. The more you know by His grace through His Spirit, the more you will seek. You will want to know more. And don't worry. You won't run out of things to know and learn about God. I still remember as a new Christian being in discipleship. And I remember after going through discipleship one, basic discipleship, which many of you are familiar with. I told my discipler, I think we're done. This is all I need to know. And he said, oh no. You got a lifetime ahead of you, young man. Oh, it is inexhaustible. The more we know, the more we're going to want to know. And it's not one of those things where I've attained a certain knowledge and now I'm dissatisfied because I want to know more. No, there's a continual satisfaction in everything that I'm learning and I want to know more. So I'm satisfied the entire time. You know, we can't be casual with this. 
We can't be casual with this. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6 reminds us how serious this is. Hosea 4, 6 says this, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I reject you from being a priest to me and since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Dear church, this is serious. If we want to be discerning people that comes through the knowledge of our Savior and the knowledge of our Savior comes through the Word of God. Bible reading. Second, don't be naive. Don't be naive. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 again says, But test everything. Hold fast what is good. The word test means to discern. It means to examine. It means to scrutinize. We are instructed to do these things and examine everything. You know what everything is? Everything. Movies, music, video games, trends, fashions, the news. Whatever comes your way, dear church, put it to the test. Put it to the test. Here's another one. Seek wise and godly counsel. You know, this is why discipleship is so important. Seek wise and godly counsel. Proverbs 12:15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Proverbs 11:14, where there is no guidance, a people falls, but in an abundance of counselors there is safety. Proverbs 19, verses 20 and 21. Listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. You know, those are great, aren't they? You know, the Lord has given my wife and I the privilege of serving in diverse capacities from our young people to our college age, to our young professionals, to our seasoned professionals. And what I've found in encouraging these wide range of individuals in different seasons of life is often good things are desired. Relationship, career, success, good things. What I've also found is most often it's gone about pursuing in unwise ways. You know, dear church, we need to seek counsel from those who have lived life and have walked and walked strongly with Christ and is mature in their faith. Why? Because these saints have been through the battles. These saints have been through the valleys. These saints have the scars that have afforded them biblical wisdom. And so heed their counsel. Again, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. You know, a few weeks ago, I made, just me, I made meeting indoors the absolute primary issue. That was the hill for me to die on. I have a problem, and I trust you do too, with the church being considered non-essential. While other more questionable categories of business remain considered essential. You know, I praise the Lord for a plurality of of elders, because I was challenged to discern what is primary and what is secondary. I was challenged with what the scriptures say. The scriptures don't say you must meet indoors. It calls the church to gather. To gather. I was encouraged to discern 
what was primary, which was the church gathering. And praise the Lord that we're able to do that right now. Do I prefer to be inside? Of course. At some point, will we be transitioning back in there? Yes. But through wise counsel, it will help me focus on the main thing, gathering together. And so how is such discernment to be obtained? We receive it as Christ did himself. By the anointing of the Spirit, through our understanding of God's Word, and through the experiences that God places in our lives of His grace. You know, in a bank, you've probably heard this analogy example before. When a bank hires an employee, they are trained to recognize counterfeit bills. Now, one would think the best way to recognize a counterfeit would be to study counterfeits. The problem, though, is there are new and different counterfeits being created every day. The best way to recognize a counterfeit bill is to have an intimate knowledge of the real thing. Having studied authentic bills, then a bank employee is not fooled when a counterfeit comes along. What's the lesson there for us? A knowledge of the truth helps us identify that which is false. Turn to Philippians chapter 4 and we'll close with this. Verses 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we need help. Such a tall order in front of us to be wise, to think biblically, to think clearly, to be the discerning people that you call us to be. Oh Lord, we should be feeling that we can't do this on our own. And we can. So we need your help, God. Surely this is not the first time in the life of the church where we are experiencing an assault on truth. Father, you tell us this is what will happen and will continue to happen. So I pray, God, I ask for your protection over this local body, that we be a people that honor you with how we think, how we speak, how we live. And we can only do this through the seeking first of that which is true knowledge and wisdom in Christ. And we pray these things in His name.